This week on Government Matters. We have addressed it, but we haven't backed off. Chairman Darrell Issa on Fatara, how the Fed can cut wasteful spending in IT. It really gives people a sense of how widespread the cyber threat is. NextGov rolls out ThreatWatch, its own database of cyber attacks from around the world. To date, uh, over $800 million in, in savings directly attributable to portfolio stat. U.S. CIO Steve Van Rokel breaks down the president's management agenda. Government Matters starts right now. From ABC7 and News Channel 8, this is Government Matters. Thanks for joining us. Government is the engine that runs this city. That's why Government Matters. Every Sunday, we'll bring you the week's top headlines in tech, security, and management. I'm your host, Morris Jones. Topping headlines this Sunday, a sobering assessment about the impact of sequestration on the military. Defense Secretary Chuck Hagel presented a worst-case scenario if the Pentagon is forced to slash more than $50 billion from the 2014 budget. The dire prospects include fewer carrier strike groups for the U.S. Navy and 100,000 fewer troops in the U.S. Army. If left unchecked, pay and benefits will continue to eat into our readiness and modernization. That could result in a far less capable force that is well compensated, but poorly trained and poorly equipped. The General Services Administration's Federal Acquisition Service released two requests for proposals, or RFPs, this week. The agency wants to launch a new acquisition program called OASIS. According to the GSA, it will help the federal government reduce duplication of contracting efforts. The deadline for submissions is September 17th. Terms like stolen credentials, password cracking, and data dump populate a new database of security breaches compiled by NextGov. Their ThreatWatch project tracks active threats and raises awareness about cybersecurity. Hatsavella explains. What started as an internal small news project has now turned into a cybersecurity database set up to keep you from becoming a victim. It really migrated from a flat real-time dashboard into a more robust, um, very deep repository of data. ThreatWatch is a section of the nextgov.com website. It keeps track of reported cyber attacks around the world. We felt that if we could start to collect information on those breaches we know about and gather information about where they occurred, who perpetrated them, what was the effect, we might begin to see trends. The information has been compiled since November with hopes that it shows not only the trends, but also lessons in cybersecurity. There's really a wealth of information. It really gives people a sense of how widespread uh, the, the, the cyber threat is. It's not meant to be a scare tactic at all. It's really an educational tool. The public can see which industries are being targeted and where the constantly evolving threats originate. Those compiling the information were surprised by some of the things they found. While most cyber attacks originate overseas, this project shows a significant amount start right here in the American office. It's people mistakenly leaking information. It's people using poor passwords, um, leaving a laptop on a train. Many of these breaches could be prevented if people followed basic measures. One of the biggest features is this real-time map showing threats across the world. It really gives you a sense of urgency when you're watching it. In three minutes, some 2,000 attempted breaches can occur. This is a tremendous problem that we really need to address quickly. And more people need to be aware of how deep the issue is and how important the issue is. Not only do you get to see the breadth of the problem, but you get to really dig into the information so that you can use it to help identify and really help, if you're in cybersecurity, really help do your job better. New technology shielding consumers and government from potentially devastating attacks. In Washington, this is Hatzovella for Government Matters. Speaking of cybersecurity, Cisco has announced plans to acquire SourceFire in a deal worth $2.7 billion. The companies will continue to operate as separate entities until the transaction closes later this year. SourceFire, based in Columbia, Maryland, was founded in 2001 and grew to a company with 650 employees worldwide. Reuters reports the move could spark more acquisitions in the security sector. The National Press Club hosted an appreciation event this week for former Homeland Security Department CIO Richard Spires. The event featured a series of speakers. DHS officials, industry leaders and others thanked Spires for his service. 
He abruptly resigned in May, just days after receiving the prestigious Federal 100 Eagle Award. FCW reports in his comments, Spires alluded to his resignation, telling the crowd, quote, people can professionally disagree and there were some disagreements. We'll turn from headlines to tech straight ahead on Government Matters. He's developed a reputation as an uncompromising budget hawk. Now Representative Darrell Issa is taking on federal IT reform. Our exclusive interview on Fatara next. In technology matters, Fatara, the Federal IT Acquisition Reform Act. Last month, it passed the House with bipartisan support as part of the 2014 defense bill. The goal? To increase the accountability and authority of federal CIOs. Earlier this week, I sat down one, with one of the bill's co-sponsors, House Oversight and Government Reform Committee Chairman, Darrell Issa. I remember the 1990s, a similar bill known as the Klinger Cohen Act passed in the Senate, later the eGov Act. How is this new bill different? Well, it really builds on Klinger Cohen. That, that bill decided that we had to professionalize the IT workforce and people understand that you have a chief, a CIO, somebody who's in charge of these programs, who's in charge of the, the budget of, of spending on IT. Except it turns out that except for one CIO, none of them have budget authority. What our bill does is it takes the intent of Klinger Cohen modernizes it and brings financial responsibility to these chief officers. How much money will it save U.S. taxpayers? Saving money is not the primary goal of the bill. Budgets have been created, 81 billion plus dollars accountable for IT. What we want is we want to get the value out of that 81 billion. There's a plenty big backlog of good IT programs that if implemented would save money, would reduce waste, would allow for greater accountability, even make our war fighters safer in the field. What we want is that $81 billion to go further and do what it was intended to do. You have a key ally in this effort, Representative Jerry Conley. He's urged the White House to sign this bill, provided it passes in the Senate. You and Conley don't always see eye to eye. Talk about that relationship. Well, I think when it comes to creating real opportunities for efficiencies, Jerry and I can work together. Often what he finds himself is he finds himself representing the federal workforce rather than the efficiency and effectiveness of the federal workforce. In this case, we're on the same line, uh, and I think he's acting much more like his predecessor, Tom Davis, who always was looking for ways to make the federal government do its job better. Earlier this month at a public IT event, Conley criticized the Office of Management and Budget. He says OMB dropped the ball on IT reform. Do you agree with him? They did, uh, but it's not uncommon. You know, uh, OMB always says, let us handle it, we have the authority. And then you get a new OMB director and he or she starts over with the same line. Uh, I think Jerry and I both have learned that Congress has a role, and the role is where we pass a law, it outlives any OMB director. Won't this change, in essence, to cause some friction between the CIOs and the appropriations within each of those 16 agencies? I think it's important to understand that Congress creates appropriations, puts money into a budget, and routinely takes input as to reuse of money. Uh, and that reprogramming right now Congress looks and says, who, do we, who, do, who actually decides where the reprogramming request comes from? It'd be very good to have the CIOs at the table saying, this is the reprogramming authority I need, why I need it, and what it's for, and be accountable. Early on, some software companies were concerned that this act has a bias for open source solutions, meaning free software that will help the government save money. Have those concerns been addressed? We have addressed it, but we haven't backed off. Uh, open source, writing software that can be used again and again and built on is a fundamental point that I think the government has to get to. Often we, we assume that if we buy proprietary software from somebody else that somehow it's better. But the truth is we've often paid for that proprietary software and when we want it modernized we pay again and when a different part of government wants it we pay again. What we'd like to do is to the greatest extent possible build on software that we don't have to pay for again. We have good support from the industry for it. We understand there are some who would like to see this narrowly construed, but we think it's a real money saver. It also means that people will build on the same base of reliable software. 
Congressman Darrell Issa. We'll turn from tech to national security straight ahead on Government Matters. The X-47B can launch, navigate, and land on its own. Our panel breaks down the future of military performance next. In security matters, the future of military drone performance. The Navy successfully landed a drone the size of a fighter jet last month aboard the USS George H.W. Bush. It's a first. It's also a top military priority. Now the nation's major contractors are lining up to help the Navy build a fleet-ready drone by the year 2020. For more, we turn to our guests on Government Matters. Rear Admiral Matt Winter, the Navy's Program Executive Officer for Unmanned Aviation and Strike Weapons, and Phil Finnegan, an aerospace and defense industry expert with the Teal Group. Admiral, why is this program so important and what does the Navy hope to accomplish? Well, Morris, the uh, demonstration of the X-47's launch and recovery aboard the George H.W. Bush was a true inflection point, both technically and operationally, for the United States Navy. Uh, we were able to demonstrate the feasibility to operate that unmanned system, not just the air vehicle, but the technologies and the maturation of those technologies and the command and control and the digitization of the carrier to successfully operate the X-47B. It truly was a historic event for the United States Navy and has set the stage for us to go forward uh, into our next program of record, the U-Class program, uh, to field a full operational capability by 2020. Watching that video was incredible. And Phil, Northrop built the test drone. Does that mean they have a huge advantage over the competition here? Uh, absolutely. Northrop Grumman is in a strong position. I mean, they showed, demonstrated that they could build a system that could do arrested landings on a carrier. They could deal with things like the strong electromagnetic interference aboard a carrier. Um, and they also have additional advantages. I mean, they are very well familiar with uh, naval UAVs, naval uh, requirements they build the MQ-8 which will be the helicopter UAV that's used for frigates as well as the littoral combat ship and also the the Triton which is a modified Global Hawk for long-range maritime missions uh, but that said I mean they have they do have some tough competition you have companies like Lockheed Martin which built the RQ-170 that was used in the operation to uh, track and ultimately kill uh, Osama bin Laden, very stealthy, very secretive, uh, very capable. At the same time, you have General Atomics Aeronautical Systems, which has built the Predator family, which is used by the U.S. in Iraq and Afghanistan. So they've built more medium-altitude, long-endurance UAVs than any other com company in the world. And lastly, you have Boeing, which has a lot of maritime experience and also uh, was involved in an earlier stage in this program and built a demonstrator that was designed to show its capabilities precisely for this sort of mission. So it's a horse race going forward. Yes, Northrop Grumman has an advantage, but it's not insurmountable. It's a horse race or a drone race, as the case may be. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Admiral, last month's landings were certainly historic, but they weren't perfect. The drone aborted two of four landing attempts. Does the Navy plan to retire these drones or conduct more tests before moving on to the next phase? Well, Morris, those two uh, attempts we're actually uh, good learning for our Navy and our technical community to understand how the autonomous functionality within the unmanned system itself uh, can relate to and handle those unknown unknown situations. And they handled those successfully. Uh, as we go forward uh, and taking uh, the X-47B into future opportunities, we are continuing to assess its operational uh, execution by looking at ways to uh, focus on reduced technical risk for the U-Class program. Uh, also understand how we can operate unmanned systems of this size uh, in our what we call our research and development uh, operational areas at the Naval Air Station, Patuxent River, and across the country. Uh, I believe that you'll see uh, continued operations of the X-47B uh, at least into the fiscal year 14 uh, time period. Now, of course, this isn't being done in an R&D bubble. Phil, what role do the terms politics and budget play in this discussion? Well, they actually play a tremendous role. I mean, you have tremendous pressure on the Department of Defense budget that's being aggravated by the cuts likely from continuation of sequestration. Uh, as we've heard, these could be as much as $50 billion in 2014. And this is an, the U-Class is a new program. 
Uh, the result is it's it's very vulnerable. Uh, it has to ramp up funding in a time when the Navy and the other services are very constrained in terms of their budgets. So the likelihood is in that environment, the, there'll be stretches to the program. And ultimately, a lot of these new programs, because they don't have the constituencies, because they don't have the production lines that can lobby their congressmen, new programs are also more, more vulnerable to cancellation. And Admiral, briefly, you became a naval flight officer in 1985 and flew with attack squadrons aboard four U.S. aircraft carriers. Do unmanned systems evoke mixed feelings among former fighter pilots like yourself? That's a great question, Morris. And actually, uh, as we go forward, we've uh, been very um, articulate to show the blend and the complementary of unmanned systems with manned systems. And as our Chief of Naval Operations has stated many times, that is the strategic focus as we go forward. Our carrier strike groups remain the battle group cornerstone uh, for our power projection uh, and our maritime domain awareness. Uh, we will continue to field unmanned systems on our carriers with manned systems well into the future. Fascinating material. I want to get on one of those carriers and see that for myself. Rear Admiral Matt Winter with the U.S. Navy and Phil Finnegan with the Teal Group. Thanks to you both. Thank, Thank you, you Marsh. President Obama wants to bring the entire federal government into the 21st century. We'll break down his second term plan with U.S. CIO Steve Van Rokel straight ahead on Government Matters. In Management Matters, President Obama's management agenda. The White House says one of his first priorities after taking office in 2009 was bringing government into the 21st century. It's a multi-pronged approach that includes presidential innovation fellows, big data, and websites like healthcare.gov. For more, here's my interview with U.S. CIO Steve Van Rokel. This is the president's second term, of course. How has his management agenda changed this time around? I think a lot of the focus of the first term was on, you know, where can we find opportunities to find efficiency in government, to, to cut waste, to cut duplication, to, to drive, uh, in the context of the fiscal environment, efficiency into the system. The second term is going to carry that forward, but then also focus a lot on innovation. All right, so let's start with RFPEZ. The designers were presidential innovation fellows who described the government IT purchasing process as profoundly broken. Why? What was wrong with it? We were really, you know, not allowing small, innovative companies that were really hungry to do business with government an entree into the contracting space. And so RFPEZ was an effort to, to streamline that. The RFPZ pilot project wrapped up on May 1st. What are the plans for expansion? The goal will be to look across how do we not only uh, expand that into other areas. Uh, we're trying to capture in our first stage the sub $150,000 uh, threshold of contracting. So it's those opportunities that are below $150,000, which there are special considerations for those, into not only what are broader projects we can do, as well as what are other price thresholds. Now let's go into more detail on portfolio stat. How much money has it helped agencies and who comes up with that number? So line by line, agencies go through and understand where they're rooting out duplication, where they're driving efficiency, where they're taking this portfolio approach. They're identifying direct savings. And we've seen, to date, uh, over $800 million in, in savings directly attributable to portfolio stat. Data center consolidation is a big part of this effort. By most recent count, the government has more than 7,100 of them. How many do you plan to close? What kind of deadline are you operating on? Our non-core goal is to close at least 40% is our first goal of the non-core data centers. And so we're tracking agencies to say when you are consolidating your email system, when you're looking at opportunities to create efficiency, you know, take those systems, move them to the core or move them to the cloud and then cl start closing these non-core data centers. Um, we're, we've closed, uh, by the end of this year, we'll be at about 800 or so uh, data centers closed uh, in the federal portfolio and, and continuing down the road to, to, to further that. You've said very little publicly about FATARA, the Federal IT Acquisition Reform Act. What does it need to include to win, win the administration support? Do you support the bill that passed in the House? Congress taking up federal IT and focusing on it, uh, it it's, 
it couldn't be more important, I think, in this in this day and age and the time. And I'm, I'm you know, I'm applauding the House uh, uh, committee, the House Oversight Committee, for uh, for definitely taking it up and focusing on it. I think Fatara, as it was passed by the House, has a couple limitations. Um, one is it exempts the Department of Defense. The Department of Defense is about half of the federal IT spend, and and uh, and as such, I think a, a, a bill, a proposed bill that that uh, that exempts them is is sort of a creates a limiting factor for me. Steve Van Roco. Now commentary. Here's Steve Vito of Sage Communications. Thanks, Morris. The U.S. government employs about 2.1 million people, but only about 7,000 or so fill the elite management ranks of SES, or Senior Executive Service. It's noteworthy, if not alarming, that two-thirds of SESs will be eligible for retirement within five years. The Partnership for Public Service, along with McKinsey and Company, picked up on this trend and developed a blueprint to help federal agencies build their SES pipeline. The guide, called Building Leadership Bench, defines the magnitude of the retirement wave and provides four phases of a cohesive SES pipeline development strategy. You can link to it on our website. Considering the sequester, pay freezes, and let's not forget the cancellation of this year's presidential rank awards, it would be reasonable to assume that a good portion of these SESs will depart government, bringing a lot of institutional knowledge with them. Agencies need to make secession planning a top priority, and they need to do so now. I'm Steve Vito. And I'm Morris Jones. Your week is filled with other matters. Save Sundays for us.